Welcome to another edition of Fixing the Money Thing. We're Gary and Drinda Kasi, and today on Fixing the Money Thing, you're gonna see a picture of what I believe is probably the most dramatic picture of what the power of God can do. A young woman having a tumor made her look almost seven months pregnant, instantly healed by the power of God. Amazing photograph. It is. It's actually one of the greatest miracles I've ever seen, so stay with us. I'm Gary Kasi, and for nine years we lived in a financial, chaotic, stress-filled, visionless life. I cried out to God. He said, you're living like many of my people are, living in debt. He said, I want my people free. Your financial freedom is closer than you think. America's financial coach, Gary Cassie, shares the kingdom principles that changed his life, defeated his debt, and set him free. Financial problems, they're slow death. We're trying to change the way you think about money. This is Gary Cassie, Fixing the Money Thing. Well, again, welcome to Fixing the Money Thing. And this story is incredible, as we said. Yes, and this happened to our daughter. Our daughter, Amy, about 18 years old, started getting what we found out later was a tumor in her body. It started, though, with pain in her legs, pain in her back, and uh, various different symptoms that she was dealing with. And so we were like, what's going on? Over a period of four or five years, we took her to different doctors, and they weren't finding what was going on, but the tumor continued to grow. And it grew in such a way that she looked like she was six months pregnant. And as a young woman, that's very embarrassing. She wasn't uh, married yet. And even emotionally, you start to think, you know, is everybody going to think I'm pregnant and, and nobody's going to want to marry me? So we walked this out over a five-year period of time. And, you know, the Bible does say through faith and patience, you will inherit the promises of God. But sometimes we wait longer than we should, right? Today's program is yes. about that. Yes. The, today's program is, you know, why wait? Because actually Jesus paid for our healing and you don't have to wait five and six years to receive your, your healing. But Drinda, Amy tapped into a principle. She began to get very diligent about the Word of God in yes, the area of did. healing. And she tapped into a principle we're going to talk about today. But first, let's take a look at this picture. This is Amy, just eight hours different. Eight hours is all we're talking about here. And this is an amazing photograph. This is eight hours. And here it is the day she woke up healed. She went to bed and lost 13 pounds overnight, nine inches in her waist and was instantly healed. Her back was healed, and you can see she is a completely different person instantly by the power of God. Mm -hmm. Now, you say, well, what, what happened? I mean, obviously, she's heard of healing a lot, right, Drina? I mean, we heard healing, but the point was she enacted a principle that we believe that many, many Christians do not know how to, to tap into. We get emails all the time. People say, well, it's not working. How do I get it to work? And so we want to help you today understand how to do that and discover right. the principle that Amy tapped into. That's right. You know, Gary, when she was going through this, the, that tumor pushed all of her organs up above yes. her body, which is what was giving her the uh, digestive issues, kidney problems, That's lots right. of other problems with her system. But those, that tumor actually pushed all those organs yes. away. And you can just see overnight when she see called that. me. And she was crying and she was like, Mom, you have to see God healed me. I immediately jumped in the car and ran yes. over to yeah. see. And we all cried to see that. And then our family got together because that tumor was so hard. If you hugged her, it pushed you yes. in. But, you know, you stand on the Word of God and look at the difference. It's amazing. It's still so, a miracle every time I think about it. We took four weeks to teach this principle to Faith Life Church because we thought it was that important. So let's go to Faith Life Church right now and pick up that message called The Power of a Promise. From Faith Life Church in New Albany, Ohio, Gary Cassie shares a message with a promise. Why wait from the Power of a Promise series, now on Fixing the Money Thing. How many years do you want to wait? How many years do you want to wait to have what the Bible says is yours? Uh, during the night, it was nine years, hand to mouth, in poverty. As believers, going to a church that taught us how God loved us, how he had great things for us. But our life was, although we had a great family life, we enjoyed you know, our marriage and our family, uh, we were struggling. Pawn shops were a way of life. Everything broken in our little broken down house, broken down cars, right? 
Anyone ever lived that way before? Broken stuff. So I don't think that's very much fun. Anyone ever had that kind of happen before? You know, it's not fun to live a broken life. It's survival. It's, it's living under great stress and anxiety. It's waiting for Friday so you can stop the rat race. You dread Monday and there's, nothing, there's no pleasure in it. And uh, so we discovered something. Discovered something that changed our life. When we discovered the kingdom of God, we were out of debt in two and a half years, began to produce businesses, enjoyed life. It was fun. It's fun to have good things. It's fun to, to have results of your labor. It's, it's fun to, to, to do things as a family. It's fun. It's not fun to survive. Just enduring, just kind of plodding along. So I wanna talk about that today. How many years do you wanna wait? There's a woman in Luke chapter 13. Let's turn our Bibles and let's discover that story. Jesus was in a temple there preaching and teaching. And this woman was theirs on the Sabbath, Luke chapter 13. And she had a problem. Luke chapter 13, verse number 10. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. A woman is there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. Oh, really? The Lord said, you hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to get water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her. Now this scripture tells us something. Jesus says these words right here. Should not this woman be set free? He is then going into a legal dialogue on this date, explaining why she should be free and could be free, Jesus adds these 18 long years. It's long to be in bondage. Nine years in bondage. It was embarrassing. There was shame. I remember one time I had to mail an envelope. We'd borrow money from anybody. Who would, you know, we, we tapped out everything, man. Credit cards canceled, IRS tax liens. You know, we owed money to anybody you can imagine. Hospitals, dry cleaners, whatever. I had to mail a letter, called my dad. Dad, you got money for a stamp? His first sentence to me is, do I have to breathe for you too? He got, he's just like funding everything. He's like, we were the believers. We were the Christians of the group, right? Nine years of living like that, why? Why 18 years? Religion has no answers. Religion is more involved in its protocol and formulas than it is about people. The synagogue ruler was indignant that Jesus said, should not this woman who has legal right, daughter of Abraham meant because she was an Israelite, she had covenant, she had legality with God, she had a covenant of freedom, of healing, for healing was promised in the Old Testament as it is in the New. Why shouldn't she be healed? Why does she have to live 18 more years in bondage? Why does she have to live one more day in bondage? So I would say to you today, why shouldn't you be healed? What are you waiting for? Why should you continue on in your life as it is? Why couldn't you? Why shouldn't you have what the Bible says is yours? Do you have to wait nine years? So why? Let me say again, why should you wait if you are God's child, you are filled with his spirit, he has redeemed you, he has called you out, he said he loves you, 
you have access to the estate. Why should you not be healed? Why should you not have what he's paid for? Why should you continue in your bondage? You don't have to. He's already paid for it. So who will enforce your legal rights? The woman in Luke 13, 10 had, what did Jesus say? She is a daughter of Abraham. And she had what? She had legal rights. She's a daughter of Abraham. She has legal rights rights. The Bible says you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. You have legal rights. Who's going to enforce your rights? The answer is you are. You are going to enforce those rights. Let's look at Acts chapter 22 of a story. Paul is preaching. He's in a city, and as he's preaching, the Jews get upset when he says that God is accepting the Gentiles. They go into a tizzy. As you know, the Jews did not believe the Gentiles had a right to salvation. And so they got upset when Paul says he was preaching the gospel, preaching this message of salvation to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 22, they began to riot in the streets. They wanted to kill Paul. And in verse 23, Acts 22, verse 23, as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust in the air, these are Jews, the commander, this is a Roman commander, ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks. The Romans, like, what is going on out there in the streets? There's a riot going on. What is going on? There's this guy out here named Paul. They drag him into the barracks, and they directed that he be flogged, that means whipped, and questioned in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this, and they stretched him out to flog him. And Paul said, everyone say the word said. Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't ever even been found guilty? Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who's not been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it, what are you going to do? This man's a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and said, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, Paul said. Then the commander said, I had to pay a big price for my citizenship. Paul says, I was born a citizen. Those who are about to question him, these next two words, I want you to circle, underline. Those who are about to flog him did what? Withdrew, help me out, immediately. Immediately withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. Now, the parallel of this story is the Bible says you have an adversary, this woman that had been bent over for 18 years, the Bible says Satan had bound her illegally. She had covenant legally she could be free. The Bible says that if we submit to God, the devil will flee from us in terror. The Bible says resist him and he shall flee from you in terror. The Greek literally means to run from you in terror. So how did Paul escape the flogging? He knew his legal rights. He said, wait a minute, stop. This is not legal. It is not legal that you flog me. And so the Jews, the, the first the commander, the Roman commander, took him back into the barracks. The Jews were all upset. They wanted to kill Paul. So they devised a second plot to get to him. They said, okay, tomorrow, let's ask Paul to be brought to the Jewish court, the Sanhedrin. And as he's being brought to the Sanhedrin, let's ambush him and kill him. Paul's sister, her son, I think it was, or his sister, overheard the plot, came to Paul and told him what she'd heard. Paul asked to speak to the commander. So he does, he tells the commander about the plot to, to kill him. And then in verse 23 of chapter 23, Acts 23, 23, the, the centurion, the captain there, called his centurions, two of his centurions, and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea tonight at nine o'clock, provide mounts for Paul so that he may be taken what? What's the word? 
safely to Governor Felix. Now, I want you to get a picture in your mind here. In one situation, Paul, who is a Roman citizen, is about to be flogged. The second situation, Paul, a Roman citizen, is being escorted by 270 military personnel safely out of that situation where he was destined to be killed. You with me? What's the difference? What was the difference? In one instance, he said, he spoke up, he knew his rights. Same person, same legality, but he said, he made sure they knew that he knew his legal rights. You see, we have a lot of Christians being flogged. I'm suffering for Jesus. I'm suffering, I'm enduring for Jesus. Well, you know, I'm just enduring life. You know, I don't know God someday. I mean, nine years from now, I mean, I don't know. I'm just enduring all this. I, you know, I don't know. Is he, God's teaching me something. Because they don't know their legal rights. And then we have people who know their legal rights. They're enjoying. See, that's what you're in. Nine years in bondage. We just didn't know our legal rights until we, God taught us. And then we go, wait a minute. Enough's enough. You know, if the Bible says it's mine, it's mine. I don't have to live this way. I have legal rights. Satan, back off. My body was sick. I said, this is illegal. God healed me. My finances are broken. Wait a minute, this isn't legal. This isn't God's way for my life. God prospered me. See, how long are you going to put up with it? Nine years? 18 years? How long do you want to wait before you have what God says is yours? The answer is you don't have to wait. It's already been paid for. Listen, write this down. What you know and do not know is life and death. Hosea chapter four, verse six, this is in your notes. My people are destroyed for lack of anointing. <laughs> lack of having a nice house. My people are destroyed for lack of having enough churches in the city of Columbus. Maybe. Because hopefully the church is doing teaching knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's your answer. Knowledge. The lack of knowledge. People play church. They play religion. They just show up. Church is a, is a, is a moment of time on their calendar. They are not serious. They don't know their legal rights. They don't understand. Paul says, hey, wake up. You have an adversary. Be alert, be on guard. The adversary, the devil, is roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. He is the thief. He kills, steals, and destroys. He is the author of everything evil and, and uh, of death and of sickness and disease. Satan bound this woman for 18 years. Wake up, wake up, wake up. You've got to know your legal rights. You may think you're surviving from day to day. You're being flogged. Well, I can put up with that. I can put up with that. I can do that. I'm okay. I'm surviving. There's more than that. There's life. There's potential. There's freedom. What you know and do not know is life and death. So let's talk about this for a minute. How's God going to build his church? How's he going to build your life? How are you going to build your life? Matthew chapter 16. Let's find out. Drend and I discovered principles. We found out the Bible gave us legal rights, how to tap into those things. Our life changed. We're out of debt two and a half years, built our dream home, you know, built companies. We, our life changed. It was a lot better to have groceries in the house. It was a lot better to be able to pay for the braces on my kids' teeth. It's a lot better to have a car that I didn't worry about breaking down with my wife at midnight with the kids in it, driving through Columbus. It was better to know that I had benefits and God's household, amen? amen? Matthew chapter 16, verse number 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is, meaning himself? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, but what, what about you, what do you say? Simon Peter said, you are Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. 
And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. The word Peter literally means stone. Peter was not the Pope. Sorry. The rock he's talking about is not Peter. The rock he's talking about is the revelation that Peter had that he was the Christ, the foundation, cornerstone of the building that God is building called the church. He is the cornerstone. On this rock, the revelation of Christ, that he was Christ, God is going to build his church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, keys inferring authority. I'm going to give you the authority of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind, say whatever I bind, not your pastor. It says who? You bind. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So understand this. Whatever you bind, heaven backs up. Whatever you loose, heaven backs up. You are the agent. You are the church. You are the agent of his government. What you bind. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 that all angels are ministering spirits sent to minister unto those who have salvation. All angels. Jesus said I, he could have called 12 legions of angels when they are about to crucify him. So I could call 12, 12 legions of angels, he said. You see, heaven stands at attention waiting to back up what you release, what you loose in the earth realm or what you bind. You with me? How's Jesus going to build his church? Gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. How? Because he's given the church authority. Jesus is going to build his church on kingdom authority. You will have to build your life by using kingdom authority. You'll have to know how to release heaven, what heaven says is yours, into your life, and you'll have to know how to stop the devil from stealing, killing, and destroying your life. And the Bible says the gates of hell have no authority to stop the kingdom of heaven. So how is Jesus going to build his church? Who's the church? You are. So what's he saying? For you to have success in life, you'll have to know how to use kingdom authority to build your life. So I ask you again, how long do you want to wait? For Drenda and I, it was a revelation to find out what I just told you. Because we are people that waiting on God, waiting on God, waiting on God, waiting on God, waiting on God. We knew the scriptures. We led worship in our church. We attended a church that taught us it was God's will to heal and to bring prosperity and wholeness. We said amen. We shouted. We said praise God. But we were going bankrupt and I was sick. Why? Because I did not know that I had authority. I did not know how to exercise authority. I did not know how this whole thing operates. Nine years. I went through hell on earth when I didn't have to. It had already been paid for for my freedom. I didn't know how to exercise my freedom. And as a, as a pastor and as someone who travels and preaches and teaches, this is uh, epidemic. Epidemic. How long do you want to wait to receive what God says is yours? Welcome to another edition of Fixing the Money Thing. We're Gary and Drew to see again talking about your life and about how great God's promises are yes. in reference to allowing you to be something that you're not. Yes. Were, their title today, you're, you're stronger, stronger than you think. Than you think. <laughs> Amen. The grace of God in us makes us someone we're not. God plus us equals more than us. Totally. There's no way we could have done the things that we've done. Amen. I look back at our history and everything that we've come through. It's right. the grace of God. Amen. The grace of God has given us the ability because you believe you can through his strength. Well, Drenda, all week we've been talking about the promise of God, the power of the promise, and how God's promises produces the grace in us yes. to change our future. We have yes, emails coming in always. about this every it's week, awesome. so I want you to read one for us today. I love it. It's encouraging. Today. I joined Faith Life now as a partner, and within four days, I got checks totaling over $3,000 to bring in the cash flow for my immediate needs. It gets better. Uh, there was an application I had filled out for a TV show back in March. 
and the producers contacted me saying that they would like me to be on their show. Organizations who I sent my package to are now considering me to be a paid guest speaker for their conferences. There is so much more, but I will stop. I am so thankful for you and your ministry. May Father God continue to richly bless you and make his face shine upon you. I can't wait to see what happens next. That's right. And he ends it with expectation of abundance. And we can't wait to see what happens next with yes. you as well. Because you have promises. As you begin to work with the grace of God, which is released in your life through the promises of God. Yes. You are stronger than you think. We taught this series for about a month at Faith Life Church, talking about the power of the promises of God. Let's go to a session there at Faith Life Church now and join the service already in progress. One of the things about being effective in the body of Christ and learning how to walk in the kingdom is forgetting half the stuff you learned growing up. Religion has trained us all kinds of faulty things. How about this one? You ever heard the prayer that uh, parents tell their kids as they go to sleep at night, now they lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I shall die or if you should die before you wake, I pray the Lord your soul to die. Can you imagine, honey, I just love you so much. Let's pray. Let's pray good night. I'd be down to sleep. I pray that if you die tonight, the Lord will take your soul. I mean, if kids' eyes are going to go, sleep? I'm not going to sleep. <laughs> are you nuts? That prayer was a, quote, a children's prayer written in 1711. How about the song, Jesus Loves Me? That's a great song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me. So that's awesome. Uh, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Okay, great song, but wrong ending. Sorry, we are not weak. He is strong, but because of his strength. Last time I checked, we are the body of Christ. If he's strong, we are strong, okay? So you pre, you're programmed with all of this, I'm a worm, I'm going to heaven, thank God. How could God even love me? How could, I'm just, you know, how could he even love me? We're programmed with all this horrible self-image junk from religion. We have to change that. So let's start right now. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Paul is telling us who we are. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered, just a number of nothing, just a pawn to be used by God. That's what it said. Paul is quoting Psalms where Israel had backslidden and blamed God for all their trouble. But Paul says, he has to correct this. Let's put that next verse up, verse 37. He says, but what? No. Say it louder. No. no. So in trouble, are you, in this, are you going to just, just give up and weep and just carry on? No. no. In famine, you, you have lack in your family, you're just going to go, oh, poor is me. No. no. You know, it's sickness, or are you going to, oh, gee, it happens to everyone. No, because in all of these things we just mentioned, you are what? More, say the word more, than an overcomer. He's talking about who? No. Me. I don't want this to not do it the general thing here, okay? You've got to get it. Because us includes people that you think, well, they got it. You know, they're more spiritual than I am. And the Bible says you. You. He's talking about you. Sitting here today in that seat. He has made you more than an overcomer. We have just completed a series on the promises of God. Notice this is past tense. Remember we talked about the nature of God. God calls things that are not as though they are. He has legally given you the promises. You are more than an overcomer. Take a look at what Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus in Ephesians, the first chapter. And he had to make sure that he was setting the posture with this church he had to make sure they had this understanding in verse 15. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Remember you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom 
and the spirit of revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. A light come on. You need to see something. He's saying you need to see something. Ever since I've heard about you coming to the Lord, I have prayed that you would see this. All right, see what? That you may see the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Whose inheritance is he talking about? Mine, ours, glorious inheritance. Imagine walking into a giant treasury room or whatever your vision of inheritance might be, but just imagine that it's glorious, so beyond what you anticipated that you just gasp. All right, number 19, and it's incomparably, nothing compares to his great power for who? Us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. This is referring to authority, the king's authority at the right hand of the father. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed, what, all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, which infers that everything we just read that he acquired is ours in him. Is that what the Bible says? Paul says, hey, the first thing you've got to know is you are not some nothingness. You are the body of Christ filled with his incomparable power that raised Jesus out of the grave. That kind of power that brought something dead alive, what excuse do you have? Is there anything harder than that? But that power is for us, the Bible says. That wisdom is for us, the Bible says. That authority, in second, uh, second chapter of Ephesians, verse number 6, it says, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly places, which means we are in the same position he is with the same authority on his behalf in the earth realm. Now that just changes a bunch of stuff. That kind of shuts down the whining, the complaining, the issues, because there really isn't any excuse. When God has given you already all things and has given you authority and power to live life by his grace, what excuse can you come up with? All right? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul continues his discussion here, and we need to discuss this as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 22 says, Jews demand miraculous signs, Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the what? The power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Verse 26, pay attention. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Go back in history, Paul says. Think about where you were at. Not many of you were wise, inferring that you now are by human standards. Not many were influential, but that infers that he's saying, think about where you were. You had no influence, but now you do. Not many of noble birth, but now you have been born again by the very God himself and chosen by him. No one more noble than that. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. That be you. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. That be you. Previously. He's saying, think back how weak you were. Think back where you were at when you came to Christ. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boast, boast in the Lord. 
So what is he saying? You are called, you have a destiny to what? Demonstrate the power of God. Let me say it this way. You have a destiny to shame those who think in themselves they are strong. You have a destiny to bring shame to the wisdom that people think they stand in. What would shame someone that has wisdom, a higher wisdom? What would shame someone that is, thinks they're strong to find someone stronger? Right? So you are in the, in the natural realm, limited, but God says in his realm, you're unlimited with his wisdom, his power to demonstrate, to demonstrate who he is. You with me? When I went to college, most of you know this, went to college, I, of course, in high school, I graduated at the nearest, there was one guy under me, I basically flunked out of high school. And so when God called me to go to college, I went to college, wrote a paper my first year in English class, and it came back with a big red F on it with the phrase, is it possible that you went to high school? <laughs> 20 years later, I received an email from that professor. Out of the blue. I saw you on TV. I saw you written some books. Is this the same Gary that was in my, is this the same Gary that was in my class? Back at ORU. You see, God wants to take the weak, the foolish, the nothings, and he wants to make something out of them so that he gets the glory, that people see him. And it's by his grace, his strength, that people see God. And they have to stand back and go, what? Is that, is that really, did that really happen? Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 31. One more shall I say. Now, Hebrews chapter 11 is the, the hall of faith fame. All the people that did things that were impossible. Okay? By faith. And what shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, meaning making it right, administering what is right, and gaining what was promised by faith. So let me just paraphrase this. You have the power by faith to change everything. Kingdoms infers the laws of government, how you live. You can change everything, meaning that you can change uh, you can administer justice, righteousness, what God says is right, into your situation. And you can gain what the promise says. You are supposed to have what the promises say. All the promises are yes and amen. You're supposed to have them all. All right, so people also shut the mouths of lions, quench the fury of the flames, and escape the edge of the sword. And what's the next phrase? Whose weakness was turned to strength. This is about you. The kingdom, the grace of God in you, the power of God that brought Jesus out of the grave, the wisdom of God is able to change you from that I can't do nothing to you can do all things. So stop saying that. Stop saying it. That's a lie. It is not true. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you and your weakness is not your destiny. Okay? The Bible says all things are new. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus, which means I have a new future that is not tied to my past. It's not tied to my daddy's last name. It's not tied to where I failed in the past. It's not tied to anything in my past. It's now tied to that glorious inheritance I now possess in Christ and the power of God that brought a dead person out of the grave. I'm still alive. I may, still, I may have a lot of death in me, learning in the earth realm, but if God can bring Jesus out of the grave, Lazarus out of the grave, he can bring me out of nothing to make something. There's no doubt about that. whose weakness was turned to strength. I don't like to hear people keep, keep practicing and rehearsing their weakness. Well, I've never done that well. I've never do this. And then you never will. Sorry. All right, so we have a destiny. God's destiny is he wants people to see him in you. You are his body. You're the only picture they see of God. If you're moping around, why do they want to join the team? If church isn't fun, then why do they want to come? If your life isn't any different, they might as well go down to the bar and get drunk, have a good time for the evening or whatever, you know. 
I mean, we are supposed to look different. Understand this. Paul said the most important thing I need to tell you since I heard of your faith in Christ is that the power of God is in you, for you. The wisdom of God is yours. The authority of Christ is yours. And so he is saying, it's all yours. Your life has been changed from the inside out. Now, speaking of the inside out, obviously there's a process that we need to submit to Christ and change. We can talk to this, uh, mention this scripture, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Some of you guys, if you, if you have uh, made a dress, let's say, if you actually are a seamstress, you make a dress, and you don't like it, and you keep using the same pattern over and over again, no matter how many times you use the same pattern, what happens? You have the same dress. So underline this in your mind. If you do not change how you think, tomorrow will be the same as yesterday. Let me say it again. You've got to understand this. You can wish all you want. You can pray all you want. Pastor, are you saying? You have to change how you think. Because it's you and God that are going to fight, face Goliath, not God by himself. And if you think, I can't, I'm afraid, I'm afraid of people, I don't want to talk to people, I don't want to make the sales call, I don't, I have, I'm limited, I'm just not that way, my personality's not that way, shut up. Spare us all the complaining, okay? We want people that are doing something. We want, I want to hang around people that are talking about dreams and visions and where they're going, not about their past failures all day. You know what I'm saying? Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. That word uh, transformed is from the Greek word morph, which means change. We get the word metamorphosis from that. So if you think of a caterpillar to a butterfly, your life in the caterpillar realm, the natural realm, is not supposed to look anything like that when God gets done with it. It's supposed to look like a, a butterfly. Butterflies a whole lot different. Butterflies are pretty, caterpillars are ugly. You know, they have, they have these big glass buildings with butterfly exhibits, not caterpillar exhibits, <laughs> butterfly exhibits. <laughs> yeah, and you wonder why no one's around your house watching your life because you're a caterpillar still. <laughs> I can't get going fast enough. Nothing's going to work. I could, <laughs> well, thank God for the cocoon. No, I'm serious. It, it, see, when we come to Christ, we enter into a cocoon phase. In the cocoon phase, and you need to understand this because you'll be tempted to quit. In the cocoon stage, from the outside, you, you see nothing, like nothing's, everything's changed. There's no caterpillar moving, no feeding, there's no butterfly, just this thing, just a leaf, just nothing, right? But inside the caterpillar, inside the cocoon, everything is changing. And at the right season, it burst out into something that never has been, and people gasp. Oh my, that thing flies to Mexico. Look how beautiful and intricate it's made. How does it fly? It's so light and the wings and catch the breeze. And you just marvel at these things that God made. The church is the cocoon that God uses to transform, transform you from where you came from when you're trying to run all those legs as fast as you can run, trying to get anything done to where God's got to get you to change to reach your destiny. In the cocoon, a caterpillar feeds on the plant it was born on. It stays on the plant. It was created to feed on that particular milkweed, that plant. It doesn't go very far. It just feeds on that plant, content with the knowledge, if you will, of what it's doing, and that's just to eat. Just got to eat. I just got to feed. And then from the inside, it has a, a natural process where it knows the timing to create a cocoon when it's never made one before. Doesn't even know how to make one. I mean, it's never done it before. Nor has it flown to Mexico before. It's never been there before. Yet something inside it starts to create this beautiful thing from the inside out. And at the right season, it bursts out and flies. So two things. Take responsibility. But be encouraged that you're in the cocoon process. Many of you are tired. Oh, I don't see any change. Stay plugged in. Feed on the word. 
Be convinced that God's promises are yes and amen for you. At the right time, as you feed, you continue to change from the inside out. And that inside out is going to eventually burst out, and your life is going to take on more and more of the character of Christ. Just don't give out, give up. God will get it there, but you have to stay involved. Well, welcome to Fixing the Money Thing. Again, it's great to be with you today. We've yes. been talking all week, Drenda, about the power of a promise and about this photograph. It's been great, too. It's awesome. Our daughter, eight hours apart, a tumor in her abdomen, and instantly healed at night while she slept, losing 13, losing 13 pounds, nine inches in her waist. Her back was healed mm. completely. These are dramatic. This is a dramatic picture. There, nothing explains or it gives evidence to the power of God than a real story. We're going to continue today, as we said we yes. would, on this topic. Yes, and I love, I love, Gary, that, you know, the doctor even said, I can't explain this. I don't know what happened, but yeah. whoever did this for you did you a huge favor. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. great, you know. Right. Uh, you, the, you, you can't explain this. This is the power of God. Right. And we believe in the power of God because we've seen Amen. it so much, haven't we? And we have emails coming we in do. too. We do. We have lots of emails and we appreciate so your emails. You're experiencing the power of God and that's why we yes. do the program is so you can experience the power of God. Yes. And so let's take a look at that. Here's Peter and he says, hi, Gary, just wanted to thank you for your teaching. A friend of mine introduced me to the Revolution Now teachings, which flipped my lid. My wife yeah. and I decided to help our old church, which was struggling to pay for the church building rent. We committed to paying the rent for one year and from our first payment, we have seen the power of God move. Below is just a quick point form of testimonies. Uh, my wife and I were cheated out of $20,000 by a family member. At the time, we had one of our properties just go on the market for sale. It was a real challenge because I did not want to lose the relationship, even though I was hurt and angry. I paid the church rent and asked God for the money to be restored. Our house sold the first day. $35,000 over asking price. So, they so got not that only was it restored, back. they got yeah. the 20000 back, hey, they got more than good, that back. Pretty good sale. And uh, they said they had another commercial lease that uh, had difficulty with it, and the, the lease has now been renegotiated, and the terms are exactly what they wanted. They said there are so many more testimonies we could share, Gary. Thank you again for your teachings. Amen. So it's awesome. We love to hear your stories. We love. Yes, we do. We've, we've seen God do so many things. We have so many th stories. stories. We have thousands are, of stories, stories ourselves. But how do the stories happen? How, how did these things happen? That's what, we, what we're talking about today on yes. Fixing the Money Thing. And let's go to Faith Life Church, where we took about a month to cover this to make sure people got the principle, power of a promise. Do you need an anchor? From the Power of a Promise series, now on Fixing the Money Thing. Precious promises. We participate with God through His promises. How do we participate with God? We participate with what He wants to do, what He wants to make sure we have based on His promise. We participate with the divine nature by accepting the promise as fact instead of something that could possibly happen. I have it. I have it. He has given you everything that pertains to life. Amy says, I am healed. healed. When they laid hands on her, nothing changed. The next day, nothing changed. The next day, nothing changed. But she said, I am healed. I am healed. I'm not waiting to be healed. Most people you talk to are saying, I'm waiting for God. I believe God will. I believe God is going to. It's always future tense, is it not? And nothing ever changes, does it? The same people that are in financial mess 10 years ago are in financial mess today. The same people that are sick are sick today. And they keep saying, well, I don't God, you know, God's going to do that. God's, God already has done it. But you have to participate with him to bring the legality of heaven to bear in your life by how? By taking the promise as it is fact. By faith. You see, without agreeing, it's done. See, without agreement, without faith, heaven legally cannot invade your world. So faith says, it agrees with what heaven says, you have the promise, you have the check, you have the signature, based on how big God is, you know he can pay the check, so if I gave you the check, you would on the way home think I have the money to go to buy, to buy groceries, right, because you have my check, right? 
It is no different. Faith is, I said last week, faith is the substance of things hoped for and is the evidence of things not seen. Faith is agreement with the promises. The agreement with the promise of what God said is the evidence, all the evidence you need because you got his signature. When you then declare it is finished, you are then essentially releasing heaven's authority into that situation. So Amy says, I am healed. She was not manufacturing in her mind. She was not saying, I need to get my confession right. She knew that she was healed. And she didn't care what her body said about it. She knew that God cannot lie, and she was healed. So two weeks later, she went to bed, and bam, instantly, she was healed. Okay? I have made you the father of many nations. Got to get this. You've got to get this. We have been trained to touch, see, see, and feel to verify to us that something's changed. That is not how heaven works. We have the promise, okay? It is absolutely vital that you, as James, the second chapter says, a man looks at a mirror, leaves the mirror, and actually forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks steadfastly, this is first chapter, verse 22 of James, but the man who looks steadfastly, intently into God's mirror, his word, will have what it says. So it's, it's important. Galatians chapter 4. And this is a crucial, crucial part of the principle. Verse 21. Tell me you who want to be under the law, that's the do's and don'ts, are you... Not aware of what the law says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman, that's Hagar, remember? Hagar, Sarah's maid, was born in what kind of way? Your neighbor should have this underlined. Look right now, check his Bible. The word ordinary way should be underlined. If he's using a cell phone Bible, it should be bolded and bold and whatever. The normal way is the slow way, the natural way, the nine-month way, as fast as you can run way. It's like if you said, I'm, I want to get out of debt. And you look at the debt and you go, that's huge. I don't make enough money, but I possibly could work five jobs. I could, I could, I could grip my teeth. I could make it work. We could, I could do five jobs. It's filtering everything through the natural, slow way. And you will never enjoy the benefits of the kingdom that way. But his son, born of the free woman, was born, and this, if this is not underlined in their Bible, I don't know their name. <laughs> How was Isaac born? As a result of a promise. If you don't get anything out of these three weeks, you have to have that. Because it was impossible for a baby to show up. Sarah's womb was dead. There was no possibility. It was over. She's too old. It's not, I don't care how, you know, whatever. It just couldn't, couldn't happen. But she had a baby. Tell me how. The promise. How was Amy healed? By his stripes. I have been healed. It does not say I will be healed. It says I have been healed. That's how she was healed. So, he was born as a result of a promise. You see, what, the, what you have to understand is the promise, think of a seed, has within itself the ability to germinate its own future. A seed you throw into the dirt that has nothing there and you come back a few months later and there's actually food there. There's a, there's a plant there. How did that get there? Out of that dead Dirt. I mean, it's not dead if you're a farmer, but you know, there's all kind of organisms and things. But you know, to us looking at dirt, it looks like it's just dirt. You know, it's just dead. There's a plant there. How did that happen? It wasn't the dirt that did it. It was the seed that did it. In the right environment, the seed produced its own identity from the DNA and life that was there. It produced after its own kind, and it produced. It had the ability to produce that. So the word of God, the promise of God has, remember this, the power to produce itself in your life. You are a spiritual incubator. Your spirit man incubates. If you put the word of God in there and you keep it there, it will incubate itself and produce after itself. 
The promise has the ability to produce, even if you don't have a clue how it could possibly happen, you just need to receive the promise. Does that make sense? That is so crucial. This, is, this goes beyond touchy feeling. Can I get the T-bar working? Can I have the, do I have any possibilities? No, you don't. You would have already done it. You don't have any possibilities. The point, of, the point of pain in your life has no possibilities or you have already fixed the point of pain. You've got to have something else. You've got to have something bigger than yourself because you can't fix it. The promise has in itself, if you simply receive the promise because who gave the promise and receive it, you don't know how that happens, but by itself, the promise will produce the answer. That's the key. Then it goes on down here in verse number 28. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son, born by the, and this should be underlined in, your, in their Bible, or I want their name again. So Isaac was conceived by a promise, but born by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? Born. So what you need in your life is the conception of God possibility in your life and the ability to carry it out. You need the Holy Spirit to help you carry out God's design for your future because it's going to be bigger than you. You with me so far? Okay, let's move on to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. All right. When God, number 13, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Now, what is God saying? All right, so let's, let's define this thing. When God said, well, let me put it in our day. If I said to you, I want to buy your land, you would say, great. But you're not gonna take just my word for it. You're going to get a contract. Two things, my word, I, I said I want it, but you're gonna verify it with the contract that has the, the details in it. That's called a sworn statement. You can write that in your, in your page there, a sworn statement. You go, to, you go to court, you put your hand on the Bible, you raise your hand. You know, do you swear to tell the whole truth and not the truth to help you, God? I do. What are you saying? You're saying that there is a penalty for perjury and that the government, before God, you're saying, I, God, deal with me if I lie. God, the higher authority that has the authority and power, let him deal with me if I am lying. It's called perjury. It's illegal. So if, if uh, you were renting a, an apartment and the landlord came to you and said, okay, it's $5,000 this month, you would run and grab the lease and you would say, is your signature on there? Yes. Mine's on there? Yes. We have a sworn statement, a contract that states the details and so it goes on and says, here's how it works. Verse 16, men swear by someone greater than themselves and the oath, the contract, the sworn statement, the deposition, the affidavit, if you will, confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. So the lease, no, it's only $500 a month. It's not 5,000. I'm not paying you 5,000. We came into agreement. We have a sworn statement, a contract. This is the details. It puts an end to all arguments. All right, because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. So get the picture. There's no one higher than God. God couldn't put his hand on another government, another authority higher than himself to swear by. He promised already, but he wanted to give an oath. He wanted to make a sworn statement that, was, that there was no one else higher than him. So because there was no one else higher than him, he gave the promise and he also gave an oath himself based on who he was as well. Does that make sense? If God failed, let's go on here. Unchanging nature of his purpose, very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things, two things, he said it and he swore by it, in which it is impossible for God to lie. If he lied, all of creation would implode within a millisecond. Because the Bible says creation is held together by the power of his word. 
He created everything seen by his word. If there was a slight chance that he could renege on his word, all of creation would implode instantly. It is impossible for him to lie. Understand that. It is impossible for him to lie. If you don't believe me, watch the sun come up. It comes up every day. Romans, first chapter, nature declares the glory of God. It's impossible for God to lie. All right. So it says, God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope. This Greek word for hope does not mean I hope so. It means confident expectation. So we fled to take hold of confident expectation of what? The promise. You follow me? He's talking about when he gave Abraham the promise. We flee and take hold of this confident expectation, all right, offered to us that we may greatly be encouraged. We have this confident expectation, this hope, as an anchor. That's why I named today's topic, You Need an Anchor. An anchor for the soul realm. Our soul is our emotions. Our emotions are fickle. They follow everything. They don't know anything. If you say boo, they go what? You know, they, they don't know. Our emotions, you cannot live by your emotions. Emotions follow. They are never designed to live by your emotions. So our emotions need to anchor to something that will hold them in the face of difficulty. Think of a, ra- a roaring river and a boat anchored. It's steady. It stays put because of the anchor, no matter the pressure. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. When you are convinced that God can pay the check, no matter what the force of the current against, the circumstances against your life, you are held in peace, firm and secure when you hold on to the promises. That just, I tell you what, you need to take that one home with you. (laughs) It enters, now listen, this, this hope This confident expectation enters the inner sanctuary. This is the Holy of Holies. I want you to picture a courtroom in heaven. Okay, this hope, this confident expectation is in heaven, behind the curtain, in the Holy of Holies, in the courtroom of heaven, where Jesus, who went before us, has entered, please underline this, he has entered into the courtroom of heaven On whose behalf? Our behalf. This confident expectation of God's promises, this confident expectation is in the inner sanctuary, the courts of heaven. But Jesus went there on our behalf. He is our high priest, the Bible says. A high priest is the mediator between God and man. Jesus went behind the curtain into heaven itself to make sure that he made it legal and that he makes sure that we have access to everything God wants us to have. Does that make sense? Jesus went on our behalf into the courtroom of heaven saying, no, they're innocent by my blood. And the Bible says we are a co-heir with Christ. Every single promise is yes and amen because Jesus has entered on our behalf and made it legal for us to access what Adam lost. You can clap anytime you want to. That's powerful stuff. So my daughter was healed because she had access behind the curtain to what God legally could do and has the power to do through Jesus. Remember 2 Corinthians 1.18? Every promise is yes and amen. So we say the amen if we're in Christ. If we're in Christ, we're behind the curtain. Legally, we have access to all of what heaven says. We say the amen. She simply said the amen. She believed the promise and the power of the spirit then brought to pass the conception of the promise that she received in her spirit when she said, it is finished, I am healed. She had no clue how that would happen, when that would happen, that didn't matter. She knew God could not renege on his promise and she said, I am healed. And two weeks later, she was, it showed up by the power of the spirit. And it will do the same thing in your life. The same thing in your life. Stop the begging, stop the crying, stop the weep. That is not how heaven works. 
Heaven works by participating with the divine nature for something that's already been finished. You have the promise. Step into it.